All right, so um, I'm going to talk about, what am I going to talk about? Um, serious complications of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I see a lot of people with this, but I really have to, have to thank all of my colleagues. You know, we're a very uh, close-knit team, uh, especially Dr. Mayan, Dr. Moser, uh, and Dr. Louis. Uh, we all see these, uh, these patients uh, together. Uh, a little bit about uh, nomenclature. Uh, so, you know, this used to be called Shelton Brun syndrome. We don't do that anymore because of his activities during World War II. It really was, you know, first described probably by Lariche and a bunch of, bunch of French uh, neurosurgeons who noticed when they did evacuations of subdural hematomas that it really seemed like the brain wasn't coming back up. Uh, and they thought it's because they're leaking spinal fluid. I don't know how to say spinal fluid in French, which is why I just have l'hypotension du CSF. Um, then, uh, you know, because we know, you know, thanks to Dr. Mokri's work in the 1990s, that a lot of people who have this, that they don't have low pressure when you, you know, either do ICP monitoring, which I never do, uh, or LPs, right? So a lot of people don't have hypotension. Uh, some people call it uh, CSF hypovolemia. Uh, of course, hypovolemia means low plasma volume or low blood volume. Uh, so I, you know, I don't like that term uh, either. Uh, you know, serious complications. You know, there are a lot of different uh, symptoms that these patients can have, and uh, of course, mostly it's the headache. And, and probably almost everybody who has a leak will say, "Well, that's the serious complication." Uh, but I just, I just sat down one day and I, I wrote down some, some symptoms, some you know, patients that we've seen over the years uh, where it seems to be uh, more than you know, the typical uh, headache and associated symptoms. Um, but it you know, doesn't mean that whatever other symptoms they have, that that's not serious. And uh, I wrote down coma. I think everybody would agree that's kind of a serious complication. Uh, frontotemporal dementia, uh, superficial siderosis, bibrachial amyotrophy, spinal cord herniation, and uh, diffuse non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And some of these are very well established as related to a leak, and, and others are not at all. And I, I grouped them like this, uh, not, not in error, it was on purpose, in that uh, you really can see you know, any type of spinal fluid leak. And we'll talk a little bit later about the different types. There are mainly three types. Number one are uh, dural holes or tears. Number two are uh, meningeal diverticula. Number three are CSF venous fistula. So you can see any of those with coma. With frontal temporal dementia, uh, except for that one patient that Dr. Maya showed you with the CSF venous fistula and one other patient where we found a leak, the other 30 patients, we were never able to identify a leak. Uh, so it's probably, you know, separate from the other types of uh, CSF leak. And then for the, the lower four uh, complications, all of those people have a type 1 ventral CSF leak, but, but not really. So some people with superficial siderosis just have cysts. And uh, we saw one patient that also Dr. Maya showed with bibrachial amyotrophy, uh, where the leak was actually, uh, was a lateral leak, was not a ventral leak. So coma, we've seen about uh, 1,000 patients since 2001 who meet the criteria uh, for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And uh, out of those uh, 1,000, 16 of them uh, had uh, coma. So most of those people are local, right? So when we compare them to patients with spontaneous intracranial hypotension who did not have coma, a lot of them were, were residents of either you know, uh, LA, or they were from adjacent counties and they were transferred over here because, you know, they had subdurals or, or whatnot. It also seems to be more common in men and it also is more common in the, uh, in the older age groups. Uh, and also when I compared them to ones without coma, more of them required surgery. And that probably, it, I don't think it's, it's more difficult to treat per se, but you just, you know, you feel that you need to do something because, you know, the patient is in coma. Uh, out of these 16 patients, you know, 13 of them were, were men, only, only three were women. Um, uh, these, uh, these are uh, sagittal uh, MRI scans of the first 15 patients we saw, 
and like Dr. Maya uh, showed you, uh, all of these people have uh, very distorted midbrains, uh, pons. Uh, they all have bilateral temporal lobe herniation. Um, and uh, what we, uh, when we, when we looked at this uh, a little bit uh, more carefully, uh, we were able to identify sort of four different pathways that these patients uh, come to medical attention to. So about 30% of them, uh, it's a coma that occurs in somebody who already has other symptoms of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, and then they just lapse into a coma. And that can be after a few days, weeks, sometimes months, but this is prior to treatment. So some of those people uh, were diagnosed with the CSF leak, but they were just awaiting treatment. Not because somebody you know, couldn't schedule a blood patch, but sometimes just because the blood patch was scheduled for the next day, and that night they lapsed into a coma. And then what I call uh, pathway B uh, are people uh, who develop coma after they've already undergone treatment besides bed rest uh, for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So mostly that is uh, a population of patients who have been treated with blood patches, sometimes with glue. Uh, that also includes people who are like, you know, have a GCS of maybe 12 or 13, but aren't quite you know, in, in a coma yet, uh, and then in spite of treatment, uh, they lapse into a coma. And then uh, there's this other category, uh, what I call pathway C, where people have subdural hematomas, spontaneous subdurals, and they're due to a CSF leak, and then whether or not it's related, it's not treated, uh, and they undergo their evacuation, and then uh, 24 hours, 40, usually not right away, 24, 48 hours later, they become comatose. And what do neurosurgeons usually do, right? We get a CT scan that shows that we think the brain is all swollen. It's probably not what it is. It's just that it's sagging, right? But there are no subarachnoid cisterns anymore. Uh, so it looks like there's a lot of brain edema, and we reflexively will put the head of the bed up. Then they'll get a lot worse. They might herniate and die. Um, so that's the uh, pathway C. Uh, and then pathway D uh, are people, we've seen a few of those people, they uh, come to the hospital for a craniotomy uh, that's related to something that has nothing to do with the CSF leak, at least not directly. So these are people who might come in for an aneurysm, an ruptured aneurysm, uh, meningioma, and whatnot, and we do a craniotomy, and again, not right away, 24, 48 hours later, they become comatose. Of course, we always think that oh, that must be related to the surgery. Uh, and then uh, we get a CT scan, MRI scan. It shows tremendous brain sagging. Uh, but you know, you can easily be, be fooled by that, and I certainly have been fooled by that. Um, yeah, so yeah, what, what I mean by this is these are, these are some of these patients. They're not patients we have treated. I don't know where they were treated. Uh, but their, their family has sent me their, their imaging, and not for medical legal purposes, but you know, just to see what I thought about it. So this, this CT scan on the, on the left there with those large bilateral PCA infarct, it was a, I think, 42-year-old man, spontaneous subdurals, totally lucid, undergoes burr holes 24 hours later, becomes comatose, puts the head of the bed up, patient herniates and dies. Uh, the MRIs on the right, what's that supposed to show our little uh, brainstem infarcts? Same situation. He did not die, but he was left uh, quadriplegic because of his uh, uh, brainstem strokes. So, uh, you know, also sometimes you're in the situation where somebody wants to come see you, right, and they have bilateral subdurals and they might be a little bit obtunded. Uh, it's, I think it's safe for those people to fly. Uh, they just have to lay down. And uh, a lot of these patients in coma, right, they have a GCS of whatever, six, seven, you put the patient down, and then they'll wake up again. But you know, you have to talk to your, your ICU team and all that. So this is a patient uh, who, uh, who was here in our hospital for some kidney-related uh, problems. He started having headaches. Uh, you can see here, uh, his exam was normal. He's got a little bit of brain sagging, like you can see there. Uh, then uh, he had uh, meningeal enhancement, of course. I think, uh, you know, Marcel called somebody that, oh, it looks like it's a, it's a leak. Uh, it was after 2 o'clock, so we couldn't get a blood patch. 
Uh, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, later, later that night, uh, the patient became comatose, right? So he's waiting for a blood patch for the next day. Uh, his GCS is seven now, and we get this MRI, and it just shows that, that his brain sagging is a lot worse. And uh, he gets his epidural blood patch. He wakes up. The next day, his brain MRI is completely normal, right? It's all very, very reversible. And uh, I think this happened about a year ago, and um, he's doing great. But you can, I think, you know, if somebody like this had happened 20 years ago, uh, nobody would have recognized this, I think. Uh, this is a little bit of a different scenario. This is somebody who was uh, transferred uh, to us from Ventura. Ventura County is a county just north of here. A uh, guy was found down, had bilateral subdurals, uh, became comatose, uh, was transferred to our ICU. And you can see that he's got you know, meningeal enhancement. Uh, his brain is sagging. Uh, he had uh, an MRI done, MRI myelogram, it showed a ventral CSF leak, he had a blood patch done, he was great, but only for literally for a few hours. He relapsed. If it wasn't for the fact that he had a coma, we would have you know, just repeated the blood patch, but uh, I operated on him and he had you know, one of these ventral leaks, that's the piece of bone that you see there, and there it's sticking into the spinal cord, and then it's surgery. This is looking from the back, this is a spinal cord, it's a little nerve, and then you see the piece of bone underneath the dura. Uh, this is when you uh, dissect the dural hole away from the piece of bone, and then you can you know, very easily and safely uh, remove that, and then this is what it's uh, left with. And then uh, he, uh, he did well after surgery, too. So out of these first 15 patients we've seen, you know, coma is generally, you know, criteria is you have to have a GCS of eight or less, right? Like we're all sitting here, our, our Glasgow coma, uh, scale score is 15. A dead person has a score of three, uh, and uh, they have you know some of them have a GCS of eight. Some of them are as bad as a five. Uh, now these people we've treated, the majority of them did undergo surgery, uh, and they've all done well. So the Glasgow you know outcome scale, if you score a five, that means no disability or minimal. Four is mild. Three is moderate. And then the one, the moderate one, the one patient who didn't do so well, we think it's, it's one of these patients who had a big meningioma, had a hemorrhage postoperatively, and we think that her outcome really was uh, poor, not so much because of her leak, uh, because she had a blood patch and her brain floated right back up, but more uh, related to her original surgery. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that was coma. So the next one, Behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. So that's something that uh, uh, is something that we see a little bit more than coma. Reason is that these people generally are transportable, right? So uh, usually people don't, you know, fly a patient in a coma from. They do sometimes, but usually not. So when I compared people with this type of dementia to those without we found that the vast majority of them did not live in LA. As a matter of fact, we only have one patient uh, in LA County who has frontotemporal dementia. Uh, they all have brain sagging. So that's 100% you know, of brain sagging. Just like coma, they're also a little bit older, usually men. Uh, they accept then now for one patient, but uh, you know, absence of extradural CSF. So only one of them actually had a, had a CSF collection. And they're very difficult to treat uh, percutaneously. So most of the people that we've seen with this did undergo surgery. Um, it usually occurs in the you know, mid-30s to, uh, to 60s. Um, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is actually uh, after Alzheimer's disease, the most common cause of dementia in people under 60. And it's really, it's a genetic disease, right? It's a genetic disease. It, runs in the family, there's a link with uh, ALS, uh, and the, uh, the tenet is really progressive deterioration of uh, any kind of social functioning and personality, and it's something that cannot be treated. It's a completely untreatable, it's a terrible uh, disease uh, if you have this idiopathic form. If you have the form related to a CSF leak, then it is treatable, but it's oftentimes difficult to treat. Uh, these are the different uh, components of a, uh, of a 
bunch of criteria that an international consortium has come up with, and it's behavioral disinhibition, apathy, inertia, loss of sympathy or empathy, although I've, I've hardly ever seen that in patients where it's due to, uh, to brain sagging. Uh, they can have this compulsive behavior, hyperorality, uh, and then when they get a neuropsych profile, uh, they have, there's a lot of executive deficits compared to memory. So memory usually is fairly uh, good, although most of them do have you know, significant uh, memory deficits. Uh, this is a, a gentleman uh, who, who uh, we treated this week, um, and uh, also he had no leak on his, uh, on his myelogram. Uh, he had uh, blood patches, did great for a few days. Uh, this is uh, uh, the CT. He has this sort of unusual uh, calcification here in front of his spinal cord, and uh, this is a little a movie that his uh, wife sent me before I saw him. And uh, that's sort of what this shows is the inertia. So this, this man would uh, sit on the toilet for literally like for three hours. And uh, he would, you know, he would just never get up unless his wife would tell him, you know, you really have to get up. And if he, I don't have a video of this, but like if he would brush his teeth, he would brush it literally for 20 minutes until his wife told him, you have to, you know, stop brushing your teeth. Um, and then uh, this is uh, what he was like, you know, literally, uh, the day after surgery. I felt better after my surgery, and I'm doing really good. I feel uh, then he started complaining about the food service, so we cut him <laughs> off. Uh, but what was interesting is that at surgery, right, so we don't see a leak, but then right underneath his spinal cord, uh, he's got like these tiny little pieces of bone, right? And I removed that, but the dura underneath it, we looked at it pretty carefully, uh, really was normal. I, I couldn't see anything. So, you know, we think that some of those people might have, you know, it's usually very attenuated, the dura, and they might have little micro tears. Um, and uh, we think that's why it's related. Or maybe it's just because with intradural exploration, you might, you know, you give a, a blood patch intradurally, maybe it's just that. Um, so, yeah, so typically, right, by the time these people develop frontotemporal dementia, uh, they don't really complain of headaches too much. Uh, but they do in the, in the beginning. So these are like our first 29 patients. It's, you know, it's kind of a strange looking slide, but so this is like 30, 40, 50 year old. So in the beginning, sort of darker blue, is the period of time where these people have the typical, you know, orthostatic headaches and, and other symptoms. And then when the light blue starts, that's when they start having uh, frontotemporal dementia. And that period can be very short, right? Can be just a few weeks or months. We actually had one patient who started, had just one day of headache and then frontotemporal dementia. Um, but you also can see what the little C's, you can, might find a little, you know, where's Waldo, where's the C? C stands for Chiari decompression because they all have brain sagging, some of them with downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils. And it looks, you know, to some people like a Chiari. Uh, one of these patients actually had three Chiari decompressions done. Um, this is what their uh, symptoms are like, that uh, we talked about that. The, the other thing that's sort of interesting in that some of these people, you know, they would wake up, they're fine, and then within a few minutes or hours of being upright, that's when they would manifest these symptoms of frontotemporal dementia. And then if you would, if their loved ones would, you know, put them down in bed, then within a few minutes or an hour, they would, you know, wake up and carry on a normal conversation. Um, this is uh, just a, a slide showing, you know, very similar really to, to coma, right? With, so they all have bad brain sagging. They also all have uh, bilateral temporal lobe herniation. Um, as a matter of fact, one of our coma patients initially had uh, frontotemporal dementia and then after, I think, two years or so uh, became comatose. So there must be, there's some similarities on MRI. They actually look... I could not tell them apart. Maybe you know you can, but I cannot tell them apart. Uh, so obviously there's something else going on. This is what that looks like. Uh, this is just showing this, you know, the temporal lobe herniation. 
Um, you know, you'd think that this patient would have a blown pupil or something. That's not the case. Um, and then just to show that these patients rarely have uh, extra dural CSF, this is what uh, their MR myelograms uh, look like. So some of them uh, are completely normal. Uh, about two-thirds of them show, you know, a bunch of meningeal diverticula. Um, if they have those diverticula, then you can, uh, you know, direct your treatment at that. Uh, but if they fail that or there are no diverticula, then you have to come up with some sort of non-directed treatment. Uh, also, you know, a lot of these patients, you know, if they're smart enough to figure out that there's brain sagging but the myelogram doesn't show a leak, they'll get pledgets in their nose even if they're not leaking anything. Uh, but, you know, CSF rhinorrhea does not cause uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, and then, ah, this is a patient who, uh, uh, who saw us a few years ago. Uh, this is her brain MRI from 2007. She just had uh, headaches. Then a year later, she developed uh, frontotemporal dementia. You see there's a little sagging. That gets worse. She gets blood patches, glue. Then I... Uh, operate on her somewhere in 2015, and uh, her brain floats back up, uh, and she's doing really well. But then now she's involved in a lawsuit, and, and who are they suing? They're suing the, the radiologist who read this as a possible Chiari. Uh, I mean, nonsense, of course. Uh, but, you know, if you, you know, so, uh, you know, people often ask me how many people with frontotemporal dementia uh, have brain sagging, right? And I think for everybody in this room, it will be pretty easy to, to diagnose that. But, uh, you know, probably a lot of people, when they have this type of MRI, they'll be told that it's a normal brain MRI. We've also done some, some PET scanning, uh, not a lot though. And then this is just an example of uh, before treatment. I think this was uh, treatment with glue and then after treatment. And uh, I mean, I don't really know how to read those so well, but you know, it looks a lot more colorful after treatment. And the patient did much better after treatment, of course. Uh, so this is uh, the, the outcome of these patients. And uh, I use the, uh, you know, the migraine disability assessment scale uh, for this, you know, probably not the best scale, but Obviously, before treatment, you know, they all do poorly, right? They all score uh, a four on this scale. It's a, it's a devastating disease, really. But then after treatment, we've been, you know, successful in treating maybe 75% of those people, but certainly not all of them. I think the main issue with, with this patient population is that we can hardly ever find the leak, so we don't really know what we're treating. All right, the other thing that was interesting when we looked at this is that it, it looked like the people who had undergone Chiari decompression surgery did a lot worse. So only one out of the seven who had undergone Chiari surgery uh, had a good outcome. Uh, but 90% of those who did not have Chiari surgery. And we looked very carefully, you know, did, was their brain sagging really worse, the ones who had surgery? That was not the case. Did they have worse symptoms? That was not the case. So. I think it's related to the procedure itself, and when you do Chiari surgery, uh, at least when you do it you know, with opening the dura, which is how 90% of these surgeries are done, it's possible that these patients develop uh, intradural scarring, and that might you know, prevent the brain from floating back up. Uh, yeah, Dr. Maya talked about this already, superficial siderosis. Uh, we've seen that in about 5% of patients. It's almost always asymptomatic. It's just a little bit of uh, superficial siderosis, but sometimes it does become symptomatic. You know, these are people who develop uh, hearing loss, usually bilateral, and, uh, and can be very bad gait ataxia. And then of all patients who have symptomatic superficial siderosis, uh, one third of those have a spontaneous uh, CSF leak visible on, uh, on spine MRI. And uh, uh, we, we recently saw two people, there was a little bit of a, nobody really knew why does that happen when you have a leak, and we thought maybe, you know, your brain falls down and you tear little veins uh, over the cerebellum, because 
that's the, the main point of the superficial siderosis, is the superior cerebellar surface. Uh, but then we found two people who had superficial siderosis, who we saw like within a few days of onset of symptoms. And here you can see this, this black blackness here, that's blood within the ventral CSF collection. And here you see uh, blood within the thecal sac layering out here. So it's probably bleeding at the site of the uh, spinal fluid leak. Uh, this is just an example of you know, superficial shit. This was somebody who was very symptomatic. He was a, a nurse from New York City. And he had a, a ventral leak. This is what it uh, looked like. He had a, a slit-like opening in his dura. Um, also, his dura looked kind of dirty. He's got all this hemosiderin, um, you know, not just in the spinal cord itself, the subpeal zone, but also within the arachnoid. And then we just, uh, we sutured it, and then uh, his leak was gone. It's really not meant to make people better. It's just to stop the uh, progression. And then this is what that looks like under the microscope. These are uh, the iron deposits uh, this is actually all within the, uh, within the arachnoid. Uh, spinal cord herniation, pretty uncommon. Uh, we've seen less than 10 people. Uh, this is what they usually looks like. All of those people have a CSF leak. So usually a couple of years of a leak kind of symptom, then they develop, develop paraplegia, paraparesis, uh, brown cigar kind of symptoms. Uh, it will often come back. This is somebody who had surgery 10 years earlier. If you don't close the dura, uh, there's a tendency of that to, uh, to come back. And then this bibrachial amyotrophy. These are uh, usually also people who have their leak symptoms for a while, right? So usually it's like years or decades. Then they start having atrophy, weakness in their shoulder, uh, girdle muscles, uh, arms, and, uh, and hands. Uh, this is what that looks like. So there's a, you know, a big collection of CSF. Uh, around the, uh, the dura. Here you can see the, uh, the shoulder atrophy. This is a guy in his late 30s who had a leak when he was uh, hitchhiking through Brazil in 2000. So he'd had a leak for about 16 years. And that's really all he can, he can do with his arms. And it's, I mean, that's you know, very debilitating. Um, and also the goal of surgery for this is you know, to prevent it from uh, getting worse. Um, and this is really, so it's, you know, it's mainly the, the shoulder arm uh, muscles, uh, even though oftentimes the hole is somewhere in the thoracic spine. Um, this is the youngest patient we've treated uh, with this, so there's a lot of stretching of the cervical nerve roots. Uh, this was the one with the lateral leak that you can see on the DSM. And then this is what it looks like after surgery. So with him, I'm hopeful that, you know, because he's so young, that he will get better. Uh, this was uh, somebody else that kind of going to tie into our next talk. So somebody with uh, bibrachial amyotrophy, very saggy brain, looks better after surgery. Pre-op, he had this collection. Post-op, looks great. Then he starts having really bad high-pressure headaches, rebound high-pressure headaches. He cannot tolerate diamox. He lives on another continent. And then he got his symptoms back, and he started leaking again from where we had sutured uh, the tear. Uh, luckily, now by now, it's gone again, but he's back on uh, very high doses uh, of diamox. Uh, this is something we've only seen twice. So these are people with very significant subarachnoid hemorrhages. Uh, they got a bunch of angiograms. Nothing is shown. Uh, then we usually get a spine MRI or at least a neck MRI. Maybe there's some AVM. And then on one of these people, we found their, their little ventral leak right there. That's what that looked like at surgery. Uh, but we've only seen that in, uh, in two people. Thank you. And then next year, uh, come back. We'll do it on uh, October 13th. <laughs>